Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here for one of our monthly webinar series. Um, just as a reminder, before we get going, be sure to submit any questions you have throughout this presentation into the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel. Also, you can find today's presentation slides in the handouts tab section on your control panel. With us today, we have Nathan Potter with Kat Sapper and Miller, who will be presenting New Year, New Rules, Changes to PPP and the Employee Retention Credit Effect and How It Affects Trucking. All right, great. Thanks, Kenzie, and thanks to everyone for, for tuning in today. As, as Kenzie mentioned, my name is Nathan Potter. I'm a tax director with Kat Sapper and Miller, and I'm a member of our, our KSM Transportation Services team. And uh, what we want to talk about today is some of the changes that came into effect related to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Employee Retention Credit as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act that, that passed on December 27th of, of last year. So first off, jumping in, we'll, we'll start off talking about uh, some of the changes related to the Paycheck Protection Program. So one of the uh, one of the big items when the Paycheck Protection Program first kicked off last spring, um, basically uh, the program was designed to allow for forgivable loans to companies to help keep employees on the payroll. And obviously a, a big benefit of that was that that forgiveness was not going to be treated as taxable income for tax purposes. Well, the IRS subsequently came out with a notice at the end of April of last year, basically stating their position that any of the expenses that were used to achieve that forgiveness would be treated as non-deductible expenses for tax purposes, which essentially is still taxing that loan uh, for all the borrowers that were that were taking advantage of that program. So. Um, this was huge when it came out as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act that these expenses are now going to be deductible for, for tax purposes and basically overrides uh, the IRS's previous stance on this. Um, you know, a lot of our clients, as we were doing uh, quarterly uh, tax planning and year end tax planning, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty here with regards to the estimated payments that they would need to pay in because. You know, there was a lot of discussion uh, amongst Congress that, you know, that there would be additional legislation that would that would pass that would allow for these expenses to be deductible. And that's what that was what was necessary was additional legislation to get that done. Uh, and the Consolidated Appropriations Act did that. So great news uh, for borrowers of, of PPP loans that, that these expenses are now tax deductible. And this is actually retroactive back to the beginning of the program. Uh, for last year, so it applies to all PPP loans, including these second draw loans we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Another important piece of this is that it provides clarification that there will be a basis step up for both partnerships and S corporations that took out PPP loans. So um, typically, when you have uh, a tax exempt income, you will get a basis step up for that tax exempt income to offset the expenses that are associated with that. So really it's a net zero impact on your basis. But without this basis step up, if you take those deductions uh, for tax purposes, but you don't have the basis step up for the tax exempt income treatment, essentially you could be taxed on this down the line. So it is important to note that you will get a basis step up uh, for tax purposes uh, with the forgiveness of the loan. Now, one area where we're still trying to get clarification on, there likely needs to be additional guidance on this, is exactly what year um, that step up will occur. If you take the conservative look at it, you would think that that step up would occur once you actually receive your forgiveness letter from the SBA, and you're for certain that that loan is going to be forgiven. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people that have submitted their forgiveness applications and they're still waiting to receive that forgiveness letter, or for those that didn't get their forgiveness applications submitted until this year or, or maybe in the coming weeks or months, um, you know, the expenses are going to hit in 2020, but you won't get that forgiveness confirmation until 2021. So there could be a timing issue there. If that's a situation where it's going to impact you uh, from a tax basis standpoint, I would just encourage you to talk to your tax advisor uh, with regards to that. Um, now, if you already received forgiveness in 2020, the expenses hit in 2020, it's a non-issue. But this is for those folks where you're going to take those expenses in 2020, but maybe you're not going to get your forgiveness certification until 2021. So again, a good conversation to have with your tax advisor. 
And lastly, with regards to the EIDL advances, so these are the $10,000 advances for the economic injury disaster loans. Previously, um, under the CARES Act rules, this would reduce the amount of PPP forgiveness that you were entitled to. But with the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, uh, these EIDL advances no longer reduce your PPP loan forgiveness. Next, we're going to talk about uh, a new simplified application for PPP loans that are less than $150,000. So this is a form 3508S, and it's a one-page certification form where actually no other documentation is required uh, to be submitted with this forgiveness form. Essentially, all you have to report on the form is the loan amount that was spent on your payroll costs and then your requested loan forgiveness amount. So um, unfortunately, for, for all loans under $150,000, you can't just say, oh, well, I, I spent all these payroll costs. I should be able to get full forgiveness without going through all the tests and various, various tests that you have to go through to determine the amount of forgiveness there. So you still have to go through the process of looking at, you know, have I spent at least 60% of my loan on payroll costs? 40% of my loan on the eligible non-payroll costs, and I didn't have any reductions in wages or FTEs that are more than the threshold set within the program. So you still have to do those computations, um, but again, you just have to report the loan amount spent on payroll costs and then also the re requested loan forgiveness amount on the form. So it makes it simpler or more simple uh, versus providing all this additional detail for those folks with loans greater than $150,000. Now, it is important to note that you are required to retain records, um, and it's four years for any employment records related to payroll type items that you're reporting uh, on the forgiveness form, and then three years for all your other records related to your, your non-payroll costs. And then lastly, again, I just kind of reiterate what I said before is, you know, all, all, the cert, all the tests are still in place, even if your loan is less than $150,000. So, you know, we're encouraging uh, clients that have loans with less than $150,000 to still go through uh, the Form 3508 and all the worksheets associated with that to make sure that what you're reporting for your requested loan forgiveness amount is the correct amount based on all the various tests um, that are required. And there are special rules for borrowers of uh, $50,000 or less, where if you did have a loan that was um, at or under this threshold, then that FTE reduction and wage reduction, that test is actually waived. So really, you would just be looking at your 60-40 test there. Another area where there was a change related to PPP was some additional eligible expenses that were added to the non-payroll costs. Uh, that you can use your PPP loan for. So, you know, prior uh, with the CARES Act, you could use um, items such as, you know, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, all these kind of items could qualify as non-payroll costs. And then with the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, there were actually four new categories of non-payroll costs uh, that you can consider uh, when looking at uh, your, your uh, spend for the PPP loan. So the first is, you know, covered operations expenditure. So this would be, you know, business software, anything that's used to facilitate business operations, delivery of products, processing payment, tracking of payroll expenses, any sort of HR, sales or billing functions, um, accounting or tracking for supplies, inventory records and expenses. So, you know, a lot of software costs here that now can be included as a non non-payroll cost for purposes of PPP. And then covered property damage costs. So, you know, I, th I think all of us saw on the news all the, the uh, rioting and looting that took place over the summer months. So, you know, if there's damage that uh, you had at your business related to this uh, rioting, looting, vandalism um, that wasn't covered by insurance, those costs are also eligible to be included uh, in the non-payroll costs for purposes of PPP forgiveness. And then the last two items that are additional eligible expenses include uh, supplier costs and worker protection equipment. So, you know, for the supplier costs, this would include, you know, any expenditure that's made to a supplier of goods for goods that are essential to your operations at the time of the expenditure, and then also uh, made pursuant to a contract. And that contract has to be in effect prior to your covered period that you're choosing to use for PPP purposes. 
or if it's you know with respect to some sort of perishable good the contract has to be in place prior to your covered period or it could be entered into during your covered period if it's a perishable good and then with regards to the worker protection expenditures you know so this is items that you know are, are put into place by a business to help keep your your employees safe so you know this could be your um, ventilation systems health screenings for your employees respirators masks things like that so those are all kind of examples you know we have drive-through window on here so that would be for the restaurant industry if they didn't have a drive-through window before they did add it uh, that's a uh, that's a type of expenditure that could be included here um, and then one last clarification that was put out there and uh, was with regards to uh, group health insurance and, and what could be included there with regards to that payroll cost definition for group health insurance. So uh, any sort of group life, disability, vision, and dental have also been added to the payroll cost definition uh, kind of encompassed within group health insurance. So that's another important note too. So with the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, uh, basically that this new program is allocating over $284 billion for additional PPP loans uh, to be made. And I think as of last check that I looked on the SBA website, I think it was updated through January 24th. I think they've already made uh, upwards of $35 billion worth of loans from this $284 billion that was allocated. So it is important to note, uh, you have until March 31st of this year to uh, apply for uh, either your, your, an increase to your original PPP loan, a first draw PPP loan, or a second draw PPP loan. And again, this is subject to availability. So on these next few slides, we're gonna go over each of these. Um, you know, first being the increase in the original PPP loan. We really see this is probably gonna be more limited circumstances that folks are, are using this route. Um, and then there's some new organizations that were added that are able to go, go back for a first draw PPP loan, or you know if you were eligible the first round, but just sat out because you, you weren't really sure about the whole program, uh, you could go ahead and enter into a first draw PPP loan. And then those folks that were able to uh, go ahead and have their first draw last year, to the extent that you have used your funds from the first draw, you're eligible to take a second draw. And we'll go over the details on that too. So first, the increase to the original PPP loan. So in order to qualify to increase your original PPP loan, the borrower cannot have received forgiveness prior to the enactment of the CARES Act, which is on December 27th. So, uh, you can request an increase to your original loan amount, but there are certain circumstances that have to be met. So um, first being that the borrower return all or part of the loan. So if you recall, back when this program started, there was just you know, so much uncertainty with regards to that necessity certification that had to be included as part of the application that you know, I think a lot of folks that were wary um, if they would have been looked at and, and deemed that you know this this loan wasn't necessary for them to continue their operations at the time due to the uncertainty, that they went ahead and returned the loan within the, the, the allow, allowed period uh, from the SBA. So those folks that return those loans, if they feel that you know they can meet that um, economic uncertainty certification now, they can go back and get uh, get a, an additional uh, PPP loan. Also, the, the borrowers that didn't accept the full amount for which they were approved, so if you were, you were approved for a certain amount uh, by your lender and, and you didn't take that full amount of the loan, you can go back and get the additional amount that you were initially allotted as part of a, an original PPP loan draw. And then again, there, were, there was just so much uncertainty that first time around as far as, you know, what, what payroll costs can really be included, especially for, you know, certain uh, entity types or certain employers and so um, like for partnerships the SBA has come out and clarified that general partners can include their self-employment income when you're uh, looking at payroll costs for determining your, your maximum PPP loan that you can receive so you know this is something that I, I think a lot of folks that might be a partnership maybe a seasonal employer or farmer and rancher 
the rules all change with regards to those entities where you might actually be able to get a higher original PPP loan depending on the facts and circumstances. So that's maybe something to look at if that applies to anyone uh, on the webinar today if you want to go back and try and increase that original PPP loan. Now with the first draw PPP loan, uh, if you recall, the, the rule stated that um, you had to have 500 500 or fewer employees generally in order to qualify uh, for that first PPP loan. Now there were some uh, circumstances where you know businesses in certain industries might qualify under the size standard or the alternative size standard that's out there from the SBA where you might actually have more employees than, than 500 but you could still qualify uh, in for the program to take that PPP loan, uh, depending on you know the size standard or alternative size standard that's out there for your industry. So, again, for the first draw PPP, this hasn't changed. It's still based on 500 or fewer employees. They did add a few new um, organizations that are able to take a first draw PPP that weren't originally allowed to as part of as, as part of the CARES Act. So, you know, certain news organizations that have 500 employees or based on the size standard per location, housing cooperatives, uh, they're actually limited on their first draw PPP loan to 300 employees. So that's a little bit different than our 500 employee test. Um, adds, it adds uh, 501c6 organizations. They're also subject to a 300 employee or less limit it's also subject to a lobbying threshold and then destination marketing organizations which are you know generally 501c organizations including you know chamber of commerce and economic development entities uh, they're also subject to a lobbying threshold as well so for most folks on the call you're probably most interested in learning more about you know what what's the eligibility requirements for a second draw of PPP so again Businesses, nonprofits, housing co-ops, veteran organizations, tribal business concerns, self-employed individuals, sole proprietors, independent contractors, small agricultural trusts, all of these uh, types of, of businesses and entities can qualify uh, for a second PPP draw, but it is subject to certain requirements. So for the second draw, you actually have to have 300 employees or less. So again, going back to that first draw, it was 500 or less, but for the second draw, it's 300 employees or less and that's not based on a full-time equivalent uh, test the 300 employees if you've got part-time folks and full-time folks it's a you know one for one test so if, if you've got you know 100 part-time folks and, and 300 full-time folks well then you're at 400 employees so you need to keep that in mind as you're doing your employee counts to see if you're eligible for this second draw loan the second requirement is that you have to show a decline in gross receipts of at least 25% during any quarter of 2020 as compared to the same quarter in 2019. So, you know, for a lot of folks, this is probably going to be um, this is probably going to be that second quarter of 2020. Or if you're looking at your Q2 2020 gross receipts and comparing that back to your Q2 2019 gross receipts, if you've had a decline of at least 25%, then you would be eligible um, to apply for this second draw PPP loan. And on the new application that was released a couple weeks ago, there is a spot on the application where you have to indicate the specific quarter um, that you're testing here and that you're showing where you're gonna have a greater than 25% decrease in gross receipts. And then you also report the gross receipts for each of those quarters. So you do have to demonstrate that on the application. You also must have used all of your PPP round, fund, round one funds um, in order to apply for a second draw of PPP loans. Now, there's nowhere that indicates that your PPP round one uh, loan has to be forgiven. It just states that you must have used all of your PPP round one funds by the time you are applying for your second PPP draw. You also have to be in business on February 15th 2020 and there are some special rules that exist for entities that weren't in the existence for the entirety of 2019 so there's some nuanced calculations there as far as that gross receipts test and, and how you come up with those numbers so if that's you um, again I encourage you to consult your tax advisor with regards to those tests 
uh, to see if you qualify under a, a second draw PPP loan. So we previously talked about you know the size standards and alternative size standards that the SBA put out there uh, that allowed some industries with greater than 500 employees with that first draw to still qualify for a PPP loan. So it's not entirely clear yet if uh, the second draw PPP loan eliminates these standards, but it's, it seems like these standards are gone for that second draw of PPP and all second draw borrowers are capped at that 300 employee threshold. Now for purposes of that gross receipts test that we discussed, so you have to show a 25% uh, or more decline in gross receipts uh, quarter by quarter uh, between 2020 and 2019. Exactly what are you looking at when you're, when you're looking at your gross receipts here? So, you know, generally it's gonna include all your revenue as part of your, you know, typical and ordinary uh, trader business, but there are cer certain items that you can exclude. So you're gonna exclude any of your net capital gains and losses. You're going to exclude any amount uh, of, that was forgiven of your first draw PPP loan if you have already recognized that into your revenue. You're going to exclude any taxes that are you know, remitted to a taxing authority. If they're including gross income, an example of that would be sales tax. Any transactions and proceeds from those transactions between a concern and its domestic or foreign affiliate, those items are not included in your gross receipts. And then I don't think this last bullet will apply to too many folks on the call today, unless we have any freight forwarders on the call, but uh, essentially amounts collected as travel agents, real estate agents, advertising agents, conference management service providers, freight forwarders, or custom brokers. So all those gross receipts are also uh, excluded from this calculation. Now the accounting method that you'll use uh, to, to look at these gross receipts, it's it's based on um, the entity's accounting method and the instructions for the application actually indicate that it's uh, defined based on what's reported uh, under, under your, uh, your IRS rules for your tax return. So, you know, for a lot of trucking companies that are on the cash method, you may be required to uh, look at your cash method gross receipts between your, your 2020 quarter and your 2019 quarter that you're testing. Now, this isn't entirely clear yet. Um, we'll, we'll go over in a minute uh, the various uh, pieces of information and documentation that have to be provided uh, to support this 25% decline. Um, and you can kind of see where, you know, one of the items they're asking for is quarterly financial statements. Well, for most folks, their quarterly financials are on an accrual basis but for tax purposes, they might file under the cash method. And so there's a difference there. And it'll be, really be interesting to see if lenders will require any sort of you know, additional computation converting your quarterly financials from the accrual method to the cash method if it is required to be reported that way. So for a lot of the clients that I've worked with so far, we've done the calculation both ways to see if they've qualified. We've done that calculation using the accrual method and the cash method. For most of them that have uh, met that 25% or more decline, it's been that way for both the accrual and the cash method. But uh, for some of you, it may be where, you know, if you file for tax purposes using the cash method, uh, perhaps the cash method puts you over that 25% limit and the accrual method does not. So that's something to be aware of um, kind of as you're looking at that 25% test to see if you might qualify. So I would encourage you to do it both ways if you, if you have a different uh, method of accounting on your tax return than you do for your financial statements. Uh, there are some special rules related to M&A transactions. So if you acquired an entity during 2020 and now you're recognizing those gross receipts in 2020 that you wouldn't have had in 2019, there are some special rules um, for how you adjust your gross receipts accordingly for those tests. So just be aware of that if that applies to you. And then lastly, nonprofit organizations define gross receipts consistent with uh, IRC section 6033, but I don't think that really applies to uh, many folks on the call today. So what is the maximum loan amount of the PPP second draw? So essentially your maximum loan amount you'll be able to get as a second draw is $2 million. But it's gonna be looked at as the lesser of $2 million or your average total monthly uh, payroll costs incurred or paid times two and a half. So very similar to, to what we used for the, the first draws uh, back in the spring. 
Now, it is important to note that, you know, for, for certain businesses that have an NAICS code of 72, which is essentially your food and hospitality uh, industry, so this is your hotels, your restaurants, they actually can use a multiple of three and a half versus two and a half when they're trying to determine their maximum loan. And for, for this uh, for this second draw of PPP, you actually have three options that you can use to calculate your payroll costs. So the first option being that you can look at the one year period for the date on which the loan is made. Section, second option being you can look at your payroll costs for calendar year 2019. And the third option being that you can use your payroll costs for calendar year 2020. So my guess is most folks might use that calendar year 19 number because that might be the highest number, you know, depending on um, your situation in 2020. Um, that might result in the highest uh, loan amount for you for your second draw. I think that was an also, also an option to be used for the, the first draw. So if, for the first draw, if you used your calendar year 2019 payroll costs uh, to determine your maximum loan amount, you likely already have all that documentation and you've already done those calculations. So again, look at these three different uh, options to calculate your payroll costs and see which one might benefit you the most. Now, with regards to economic necessity for the second draw of PPP, there is another certification that's required to be made um, The economic conditions make this loan request necessary to support your operation. So again, that, that is on this application for a second draw. The interesting thing will be, uh, and I'm sure additional guidance will likely come out on this, is with, with the round one loans, the SBA put out a safe harbor where if your loan was less than $2 million, you were automatically treated as um, that loan being necessary to support your ongoing operations. Now, with the second round of PPP loans, since the maximum loan that you can get for the second draw is $2 million, it's gonna be interesting to see kind of what comes out regarding that. Um, I think one thing in the favor of businesses that are looking at a second draw is you are demonstrating and showing on your on your application that you have had a 25% decline in revenue. So I think that supports a position that this loan request uh, might be necessary to support your ongoing operations. But you know it's going to be interesting to see uh, what additional guidance might come out from the SBA regarding this economic necessity certification. And then with regards to the documentation that's required to be submitted with that second draw PPP loan. So again, we talked about that 25% reduction of gross receipts. So here are the three options you have uh, in order to support that uh, on the application itself. So again, you can submit quarterly financial statements and it would be for the same quarter for 2020 and 2019 that demonstrates and shows that 25% reduction in gross receipts. You can submit your quarterly or monthly bank statements and you would just indicate on those bank statements all the items and deposits that relate to gross receipts within your business. Or if you have already filed your 2020 tax return, I'm guessing that's not too many folks on the call today, you can use your uh, 2020 and 2019 tax returns as support to show this 25% reduction of gross receipts. And then similar to the application process for the first round, in order to support your maximum loan amount that you're requesting, you have to submit payroll records, you have to submit tax forms, including you know, your 941s, your SUDA filings, and then also any healthcare and retirement costs uh, that might support the, the amounts you're including in your, your maximum loan calculation. So that would include you know, bank statements, benefit provider invoices, anything like that that would support um, the amounts you're including for any healthcare or retirement costs. So that wraps up our discussion on some of the changes related to PPP. So now we wanna hop into the employee retention tax credit section uh, of the presentation today. And the employee retention uh, tax credit is actually a payroll tax credit that was enacted as part of the CARES Act back in March of last year. And initially, when this first came out, any, any borrowers for PPP purposes were deemed as ineligible to claim this employee retention tax credit. So, you know, a lot of folks um, largely ignored it because it, it didn't apply to them. And this was only going to be a 2020 tax credit. But with the passage of the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, in December, it actually made several uh, favorable changes for companies. And we'll go over those here in the next slide. So 
first, uh, the most important, I think, is that this is now available to PPP borrowers, and it's made retroactive going back to uh, March 12th, 2020. So um, if you look at your, you know, your qualifying wages that are paid between March 12th, 2020 and December 31st, 2020, you may be eligible to claim the employee retention tax credit. And the way that would be done um, without without filing your your form your Q4 form 941 yet, and I know it is a, a few days from now, so, so some on the call may have already done that and some may still be uh, waiting to file that, but you can actually claim um, credits for the Q2, Q3, and Q4 qualifying amounts in total on your Q4 form 941 that'll be due here uh, February 1st. So there's a few more days left to do that. I know it's a tight window. I think the IRS realized that's a tight window too with, with all this information just coming out to try and do all those calculations and get that included on the 941. But you would, would be able, um, if you determine that you're eligible um, following the filing of the 941, you could go back later on and amend uh, if you qualify for the credit. And then another change with regards to the Consolidated Appropriations Act is it's actually extended and expanded this credit for the first two quarters of 2021. So it's extended and expanded through June 30th of 2021. There were also changes made to the gross receipts test uh, and also changes made to the uh, full-time employee test, which we'll take a look at here in a few slides. That's you know uh, much more favorable for businesses and computing and, and making uh, companies eligible for this credit. So, you know, for purposes of the rest of the, the slides here related to the employer employee retention tax credit, I'm going to refer to the 2020 ERC and 2021 ERC. And I just want you to keep in mind that, you know, if I refer to 2020 ERC, this is going to relate to the period from March 12th, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. And then if I refer to 2021 ERC, this is gonna to refer to the period from January 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2021. So that's just important to keep in mind as we discuss you know, some of the differences and nuances related to these differing periods. So under ERC, you know, who's determined to be an eligible employer? So this is actually tested on a quarter by quarter basis. Uh, and there are, there are two condition tests that, that you have to look at, and you only have to meet one of those condition tests in order to be deemed an eligible employer for purposes of ERC. So the first is a business suspension condition. So business operations must have been fully or partially suspended during a quarter due to an order from, a, from an appropriate governmental authority related to COVID-19. So, the IRS actually has put out several FAQs um, that provide you know, different situations related to this business suspension test um, that really kind of illustrate how, you know, even for essential businesses that weren't required to shut down under any sort of order from a governmental authority, they still could technically qualify under this condition if certain tests are met. So you know, I pulled up some of those uh, examples that we have here and I'll kind of go through those now. You know, again, these are out in the IRS FAQs, but, you know, if there was a government order uh, that required you to close your office, but your employees were still able to telework in a reasonably similar manner, then you would not be considered uh, fully or partially suspended under this test. So if your employees were able to telework from home, there really wasn't any sort of drop off from your normal operations, you wouldn't meet this test uh, for the business suspension condition. Now, there is an example for the restaurant industry. So for restaurants, you know, they had to close their indoor dining, but they were still able to continue carryout service or delivery services. They may be eligible under a partial suspension because, you know, their operations suffered because the fact that they couldn't ha have folks in their indoor dining rooms anymore. So uh, it is, that's an important uh, you know, circumstance to keep in mind that they could still qualify under a partial suspension for this, for this test. Um, for essential businesses whose suppliers were forced to shut down, they may also qualify for a partial suspension. So there's an example out there related to an auto parts manufacturer who gets raw materials to manufacture its parts from a certain supplier. And that supplier was forced to shut down uh, by the government due to COVID-19. 
and that auto parts manufacturer was unable to procure those raw materials from any other supplier, which ultimately affected their operation. So because of that situation with their supplier, where their supplier was forced to shut down, they can actually still qualify under this business suspension condition. It is important to note though, that for customers that were forced to shut down, Customers that were forced to shut down and lost business from, from those customers does not qualify you under a full or partial suspension. So that's that's important to keep in mind. But if a supplier was was shut down that you know that materially impacted your business and affected your operations, that could qualify you under this suspension test. And then lastly, if there was in any business that voluntarily decided to to shut its doors, you know, to better protect its employees, keep it, keep its employees safe. Um, that would also not qualify under any full or partial suspension because there was no governmental order in place there. So, you know, there's a lot of nuance there, a lot of circumstances to look at with regards to that business suspension condition. But I, I thought all those examples were, were good illustrations uh, that might kind of help you think through it on, on your end. So the second test is the gross receipts condition. So for the 2020 ERC, gross receipts must have declined by more than 50% as compared to gross receipts during the same quarter in 2019. So if, if we're looking, for example, at your, your Q2 2020 gross receipts, if those gross receipts decline by greater than 50% of the, of the gross receipts in Q2 of 2019, then you would meet this gross receipts condition for that quarter. Now for the 2021 ERC testing, there was actually uh, a favorable change for companies to where that um, percentage of decline actually dropped from 50% to 20%. So for the first two quarters of 2019, or, or, excuse me, first two quarters of 2021, when you're looking at this gross receipts test, it only gross receipts only have to decline by more than 20% as compared to gross receipts during that same quarter in 2019. And if so, you also would be eligible for the ERC uh, in 2021. One other item to note is there is an election that's available to be made where you can actually use the prior quarter's gross receipts for purposes of the 2021 ERC. So for example, if you're looking at your Q1 2021 gross receipts, you'd be comparing that to your Q1 2019 gross receipts and looking to see if there's a more than 20% decline in your gross receipts there. You can also make an election to use the prior quarter. So you could use your Q4 2020 gross receipts and compare that to your Q4 2019 gross receipts to see if there also was a, a greater than 20% decline. So that election is available. Uh, so I thought it was important to, to bring that up uh, to everyone on the call today. Now, what's, uh, what's actually the definition behind the qualified wages and, and what are the qualified wages that can be included uh, for purposes of this tax credit? So qualified wages include any wages that are paid plus an allocable share of group health plan costs. So depending on which condition that you met on our last slide uh, to determine if you're an eligible employer, there's also limitations on the amount of wages that can be deemed as qualified. So if you qualify under the business suspension condition, any wages that are paid during the portion of the quarter in which your business operations were fully or partially suspended could be included as qualified wages. So, you know, for example, if, if, if you were shut down um, under a governmental order uh, for the entire month of April, but you open back up in May, then under this business suspension condition, you would be able to use those wages that were paid in April as qualifying wages under that condition. But you wouldn't be able to include um, the items in May unless you met that gross receipts condition as well. Now under the gross receipts condition, you can actually use any wages paid during that eligible quarter uh, if, if that condition is the one that's being uh, met in order for uh, you to claim the ERC. There's an additional test related to the number of full-time employees that you had during 2019. So uh, when the CARES Act first uh, created the employee retention tax credit, there was a threshold set uh, based on an average of 100 
full-time employees uh, for 2019. So if you are under this 100 full-time employee threshold for purposes of the 2020 ERC, all wages paid to all employees could be considered as qualifying wages for purposes of this credit. But if you were over this threshold, so you, were, you had more than 100 full-time employees, only wages that you pay to employees to not work or to essentially not perform their typical service for you, only those wages could be considered qualifying wages for purposes of this credit. Now, another change that's favorable uh, for, for companies is for purposes of the 2021 ERC is that threshold was increased from 100 full-time employees to 500 full-time employees for purposes of the 2021 ERC. So again, you know, for, if your average number of full-time employees during 2019 was less than 500 uh, and you're under that threshold, any wages that you're paying to all employees could potentially be qualifying wages for purposes of this credit for the 2021 ERC. But if you're over this threshold, then again, if you're over 500 full-time employees on average from 2019, only the wages paid to employees not to work or not to perform their service would be considered qualifying wages. So now let's look at the actual credit amount itself. So for purposes of the 2020 ERC, your credit is calculated based on 50% of your qualifying wages. So um, the rules that were enacted as part of the CARES Act actually limited, um, put a limit and a maximum of qualified wages that you can use per employee per year. So for purposes of the 2020 ERC, you can only have $10,000 per employee per year of qualifying wages. So your maximum ERC credit that you would have for your 2020 ERC is $5,000 per employee per year. Now with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, it actually bumped up the, uh, the level of the credit from 50% of qualifying wages to 70% of qualifying wages. And it changed the maximum qualified wages allowed to be instead of on a per year basis to a per quarter basis. So now you can have a maximum of $10,000 of qualifying wages per employee per quarter. So you would be looking at a maximum credit per employee of $7,000 per quarter. So you can see how, you know, this with the changes that were made with the Consolidated Appropriations Act, it really could open this up to a lot of uh, new companies and it could be extremely beneficial. Uh, so for example, if you paid $10,000 of qualifying wages to an individual, let's say for the, you know, the second, third and fourth quarter of 2020, and then also for the first and second quarter of 2021. So your maximum credit that you can get for 2020 for that employee is $5,000. But with the changes that were implemented for the 2021 ERC, you can actually get a $7,000 credit per quarter. So you would have paid $20,000 of qualifying wages in 2021, but you could be eligible for up to a $14,000 credit on that $20,000 of wages. So you can see that, you know, the, the major benefit there for, for employers that qualify under ERC. So this is definitely something that, you know, I just encourage all of you on the call today to look into to see if you qualify because, you know, it can really you know, add a lot of value if you're able to claim these tax credits. And lastly, we just want to go over some other ERC uh, considerations to keep in mind. So ERC wages cannot be included in your PPP loan forgiveness calculation. So essentially, you can't double dip on the wages that you're using to claim this ERC tax credit, and you're also using to, to claim loan forgiveness under PPP. So that's important to note. You can't use the same wages for both. It's also important to note that if you're if you're claiming other tax credits, uh, you know, similar to the research credits or the work opportunity credits that are really based on wages paid, again, you can't use those uh, same wages for ERC that you're using for those other tax credits. So that's important to keep in mind. Another bullet point to keep in mind is, you know, aggregation rules must be considered when you're when you're going through these these tests. So, you know, when you're looking to uh, make those determinations, if you qualify under the um, 
full-time employee threshold or if you're looking at the gross receipts test, making sure that you're taking into account the aggregation rules with all your affiliates to where, you know, if there's common ownership, there's common management, some of those entities may be pulled in uh, to these tests, which may put you over the threshold. So that's that's important to keep in mind as you're, you're looking into this to see if you might qualify for purposes of the ERC. Uh, as a reminder, as I mentioned, the 2020 ERC, you can actually claim prior quarter qu credits on your fourth quarter payroll return, but again, that's due here in a few days. If it's not something um, you determine in the next few days that you qualify for, but later on you determine that you do qualify, you can go back and amend uh, after the fact, but uh, just pointing that out, that all prior quarter credits are going to be uh, reported on this uh, fourth quarter payroll return. And then for purposes of the 2021 ERC, uh, you can claim an advance credit based on 70% of the average quarterly wages that were paid in 2019. Now, there needs to be additional guidance issued on the actual mechanics in order to be able to do that. Uh, but that is available for the 2021 ERC. For most folks, my expectation is, you know, most folks are probably just going to withhold that expected credit amount from their payroll tax deposits as, as they're going throughout the first and second quarter of 2021 if, if they are going to qualify for ERC in 2021. And then lastly, it's, it's important to note that, you know, health plan expenses alone are considered qualifying wages. So uh, if you do qualify for ERC, you're not paying out typical wages to your employees, but you are still covering uh, their health plan expenses. Those alone could be considered qualifying wages for purposes of the ERC. So that's important to keep in mind too. So that wraps up the presentation today, uh, going through some, some of the changes related to the Paycheck Protection Program and the Employee Retention Tax Credit. Uh, just thank, thank everybody for their time today, for tuning in, and be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Nathan. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, we received a loan in the first round and requested loan forgiveness 120 days ago. Our understanding is the SBA has 90 days to respond and we have not received a response. Um, the question is, is this typical and is our understanding correct on timing? Yeah, so your understanding uh, on timing is correct. So. Uh, when you actually submit your, your loan forgiveness application to your lender, technically your lender has 60 days in order to make a determination on whether you qualify for forgiveness or not. And then when they remit that application onto the SBA, the SBA has an additional 90 days to make their determination. Um, we've seen with a, with a lot of clients, especially those that had PPP loans over $2 million, that this process is going very slow. And a lot of those folks that you know, have, have submitted their forgiveness applications more than 90 days ago, um, they have not received their, their certification letters or heard anything from the SBA yet. So you know, there, there is, a, it seems like, a, a slowdown in getting responses back from the SBA. So that is pretty consistent with what I'm seeing with, with some of our clients here. Okay, we have another one. Um, is the form, slash process for submitting economic need explanations on loans over two million final. And it also says, please describe any issues for affiliated companies pursuing. Yeah, so so with regards to the, I'm assuming you're referring there to the, the loan necessity questionnaire um, for PPP loans greater than, than $2 million. So yeah, that, that questionnaire is final. Um, I've had several clients that have forwarded that on to me, have kind of looked over their responses and kind of helped to guide them to complete that in order to remit that back to the SBA. So yeah, I don't anticipate any other changes there. I don't see that form being necessary with this second round of draws because, you know, as we talked about, the maximum loan that's that's out there uh, that you're able to pursue is $2 million or less for these second draws. It'll be interesting to see if there's additional guidance that's released uh, from the SBA or additional requirements um, related to, you know, ec economic necessity and, and certifications that have to be made. It seems like that first, the first round of everything, it seemed like, you know, every month there were changes that were being implemented. I'm sure everyone on this call felt that about all the, all the changes that seem to be constantly taking place uh, with regards to the process. So. Hopefully we don't have that with regards to these the second round of loans, but you know at this point I don't anticipate any any sort of additional form similar to that loan necessity questionnaire for those folks with the loans of greater than two million dollars. Uh, and and then with regards to those affiliation tests, so 
there's there's really no changes there uh, from from the first round. So all of those same rules still apply. So if that was something that impacted you when you were looking at your first round on whether you qualified or the payroll costs that you were including uh, as part of the calculation, those same rules still apply. So you need to take those into account. And there are some complexities there. So, you know, it, I would just encourage you to reach out to your tax advisor to help you work through that if you haven't already. Okay. Well, those are the only two questions I received. If anybody else does have any questions that come up, uh, feel free to call the IMTA office or you can shoot me an email. It's Kenzie at iowamotortruck.com. Nathan also has his contact information up there and we will be sure to get um, your questions answered. Nathan, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? That's it. appreciate everybody's time today and hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us this morning and thank you all for being here and attending today's webinar. Just as a reminder before we go, um, the slides from today's presentation are in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if nobody has anything else, we'll wrap it up. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.